All right, we're going to get started with our Sunday school lesson for this morning. We're uh, talking about God's story with Moses. This morning we're going to talk about Exodus uh, chapter 2, the last few verses of Exodus chapter 2. All right, just a second. You are turning your Bibles there, Exodus chapter 2. Uh, we'll get started, but by way of getting back to where we were, um, what we see is a reminder of the situation back in Egypt. We've been following Moses for 40 years, and now something new is going to happen. Um, he had been born into Egyptian bondage. Uh, he was born during the time when babies were being thrown into the Nile River, baby boys were going to be thrown into the Nile River uh, just for being born because that's what the Pharaoh wanted. And uh, his mother and his sister and the daughter of Pharaoh saved him. And then he grew up, spent 40 years in Egypt, uh, attempted at delivering the people of Israel out of Egyptian bondage, and uh, he wasn't accepted. Um, he killed an Egyptian and then was rejected by uh, the Israelites that he was trying to help. So he fled into exile all the way into Midian, and that was what we looked at last week. And so he spent 40 years there in Midian, which is a long time. And now we get to the end of that time, and we get these last few verses um, it's going to be verses 23 through 25, the last three. Um, and what we what we see is a perspective of earth and there's perspective of heaven. So when we read this, uh, there are four different terms that are used to describe suffering of the people of Israel. And they are answered by four terms describing God's response. And while we go through this and digest it, we have to consider Israel's suffering and God's response to it. And it raises hard questions, um, questions that you've probably asked yourself or even asked God in prayer. Uh, but let's look at Exodus chapter 2, starting in verse 23. And it came to pass, in process of time, that the king of Egypt died. And the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage, and they cried. And their cry came up unto God. By reason of the bondage. So those are the terms that we hear. Those are the that's the perspective of earth. Now we get the perspective of heaven. And God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect unto them. So what we see at the beginning of uh, verse 23, and it came to pass in progress of time. Uh, it just gives you a generic way of saying a lot of time had passed. Um, there was enough time for the king of Egypt to die. Um, so the king that was seeking the life of Moses, that's the one that died. This had two effects. Uh, first, Moses was free from the threat of death so that he could now enter back into Egypt. Um, this is a quote from Sarna in his Exodus commentary. Quote, it was established practice in Egypt for a new king to celebrate his ascension to the throne by granting amnesty to those guilty of crimes, by releasing prisoners, and by freeing slaves. An extant hymn composed in honor of the ascension of Ramses IV illustrates the custom. It records, quote, a happy day for Egypt when, quote, fugitives return to their towns and when, quote, those in hiding emerged and, quote, those in prison were freed. This being so, the Israelites had good reason to expect that the change in regime would bring with it some amelioration of their condition. But this was not to be. Hence the stress on the intensified misery of the enslaved Israelites. Moses, however, did benefit from the amnesty personally. See in chapter 4, verse 19. So we see this, this change in power, change in leadership, and 
anytime there's a change in leadership, there's there's a chance that things, circumstances might change. Uh, we see that every four years in our own country. Um, or sometimes, you know, if it's not every four years, it's uh, at the eight-year mark. But we see when there's a change in leadership, there might be a change in circumstances. But that hope was squashed for the Israelites. Um, when I think about the change in leadership and change in circumstances, I think of uh, Rehoboam. Right after Solomon's reign, Rehoboam takes up Solomon's mantle, and he has the opportunity to lessen the burden of all of the things that Solomon had the people of Israel do for him, or he could make those burdens even heavier. And he foolishly listens to his uh, fellow young men, and he chooses uh, to not lighten the burden, but make it even even heavier. But there was an opportunity to change the circumstances for those that were underneath him. And so the Israelites probably thought, hey, maybe something could happen here. You know, in the process of time, the king of Egypt had died. Maybe something would change. But it wasn't to be. Edersheim uh, reflects on this saying, quote, Once more, it seems as if the clouds overhead were just then darkest and heaviest. One king had died and another succeeded. But the change of government brought not to Israel that relief which they had probably expected. Their bondage seemed now part of the settled policy of the pharaohs. Not one ray of hope lit up their sufferings, other than what might have been delivered from faith. But centuries had passed without any communication or revelation from the God of their fathers. It must therefore be considered a revival of religion when, under such circumstances, the people, instead of either despairing or plotting rebellion against Pharaoh, turned in earnest prayer unto the Lord. And that's from his Bible History Old Testament Volume 2. So when they were disappointed, they cried out for deliverance. Again, it says right here, the, the, the perspective of earth. Uh, the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage, and they cried, and their cry came up to God by reason of the bondage, and God heard their groaning. Right? So we have four different terms, and they're all, they're all different in the Hebrew, too. It's fascinating. Uh, so when they were disappointed, they, they cried out for deliverance. Uh, it took... The experience of suffering to lead Israel to cry out to God for help. Isn't it weird? But it's true for most of us that when things are going well, we lose awareness of our need for God. Uh, Richards, in his commentary, quoting from him now, it's peculiar that it's uh, that is true of most of us. When things are going well, we lose awareness of our need for God. Somehow we feel capable in ourselves to meet the challenges of life and eternity, but a sense of need helplessness leads us to trust ourselves afresh to God. When we lose our sense of need, we may lose touch with spiritual reality. Furthermore, he continues, the sense of helplessness that comes from suffering can be a first step down freedom's road. We can never find spiritual freedom by looking within ourselves. We, like Israel, need to look away, we need to look to God. So what did Israel do? Israelites prayed. And notice it says, by reason of the bondage. It says that twice. And anytime you see repeated terms or repeated phrases, your ears should perk up. You should notice that. This repeated phrase emphasizes the severity of Israel's circumstances. But then, furthermore, there's four different words that describe their, their bondage and their their anguish and how horrible it is. First is the word side um, in verse 23. And the children of Israel sighed. Um, that idea is, is to groan. It's the sound associated with pain. Next is that they cried. Right? They cried out to call for help, an appeal, a wail, to weep, to make public sounds of physical pain and emotional anguish with the focus that one may possibly respond to the cry. Again, the next word is, their cry came up to God by reason of the bondage. This is to call out 
for help or assistance. And lastly, God heard their groaning. Right, verse 24, and God heard their groaning. This is a noise of great physical pain and suffering. In fact, it's used in Ezekiel chapter 30, verse 24, to talk about the pain of a person who has two broken arms. That kind of physical anguish is the kind of suffering and groaning and crying out that the people of Israel were going through this time. And that's what their prayer was. They were crying out. It reminded me of, of Psalm 6. Psalm 6 reads, Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are vexed. Uh, my soul is also sore vexed, but thou, O Lord, how long? Return, O Lord, deliver my soul. O save me from, for thy mercy's sake. For in death there is no remembrance of thee. In the grave, who shall give thee thanks? This is what made me think of the children of Israel right here in verse 6. I am weary with my groaning. All the night make I my bed to swim. I water my couch with my tears. He's crying so much that his house fills up with his tears and his bed floats on it. Oh, it's poetry. It's beautiful. Mine eye is consumed because of grief. It waxeth old because of all mine enemies. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. For the Lord hath heard the voice of my weeping. The Lord hath heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer. Let all mine enemies be ashamed and sore vexed. Let them return and be ashamed suddenly. But also this, this, uh, this mistreatment sounds a lot like Bacchic. Well, right there in chapter 1, right at the very beginning, starting in verse 2. O Lord, how long shall I cry? And wilt thou not hear? Even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save? Why dost thou show me iniquity, and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are that raise up strife and contention. Therefore the law is slacked, and judgment doth never go forth. For the wicked doth compass about the righteous. Therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. That's what, that's what he saw. Right? How long shall I cry out and you won't hear, God? Even if I, I cry out of violence, violence is in, the, is in the land, you will not save. How, how can you see this and not act? How can, you, how can I cry out to you and you not hear me? Why do you show me? Why is iniquity before me all the time? And I behold grievance all the time. Spoiling and violence are before me. And they that raise up strife and contention. The law doesn't do anything about it. It's slacked. Judgment doth ever, never go forth. Right? There's no righteousness in the land. That's what he observes in his time and his place. Kind of sounds familiar, if you ask me. Uh, Schnitzer from the Torah story uh, has this to share. Quote, the mistreatment of the Israelites was forecast as lasting about four centuries in Abraham's vision. That's in Genesis 15, 13. Even if the oppression is restricted to the 80 years plus in Exodus 1 and 2, so just to break in, uh, some people think that uh, the Israelites went down uh, and sojourned in, in Egypt and the Oppression didn't really start until what's recorded in Exodus, so just about 80 years. Some take it that it's the whole 400 years. Uh, getting back to uh, Schnitzer. It is striking to consider the perspective of the people and that of God. They had been crying out for more than two generations, and God had not responded. Though it is misguided to think that God was absent and unconcerned because of the long oppression, the narrator is silent on God's reasons for the delay. You know, we hear that, and it's like, he says, though it's misguided to think that God was absent and unconcerned because of the long oppression. Like, is that really 
such a misguided thought. I mean, if it's been 80 years or maybe even 400, if it's been four centuries and there's no revelation, no communication from God, that's a long time. It's a real long time. And the narrator of Exodus doesn't give God's reasons for the delay. Is God doing anything when there's that kind of suffering going on? Does, does suffering go unnoticed by God? Right? So it's just the, the problem of evil, right? People are suffering. Does God care? Well, this is where we get God's response. In the four words about how God responds to the crying out of the people of Israel. Verse 24, and God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham and with Isaac and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect unto them. So this word for God heard, this is a uh, a familiar word, we did a word study on it, shma, right, to hear. And ordinarily, when it's used, it includes the idea of responding to what is heard, right? Uh, it can even be found in idiomatic constructions, meaning to obey. We have the word shma, but it means to obey. Uh, so for God, to say that God heard their complaint means that God responded to it. So he hears our prayers. Right? God hears your prayers when you cry out for weeks, and for months, for years, even for generations. You cry out for something. Furthermore, God remembered. He remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. He would be faithful to keep his promise. Again, from the Torah story. Quote, the statement in Exodus 2 that God remembered his covenant with the patriarchal trio anchors the series of events beginning with the deliverance and leading to the land of promise entirely on his word. God had spoken a word to Abraham and he would be faithful. Uh, quoting a, a note that I found in the uh, Christian standard Bible uh, study Bible uh, from Coover Cox quote, God's remembering is more than mere uh, mental awareness. It implies action in keeping with his covenant promises. The command to remember the Sabbath day is parallel to the command to keep the Sabbath. That has the same idea, right? So God remembered his covenant. That doesn't mean he forgot it and he was like, oh man, oh, I better do what I said I was going to do. We have kind of forgot for a while. Oh man, just slipped my mind for 400 years. It's not like that. What, it's, what it means, it's, a, it's a, just another way, uh, an idiom to mean that he kept his promise, that he was going to do something about the covenant that he made with Israel. It doesn't mean that he forgot something and is now remembering it. It means that he's acting in a way to keep his covenant. And that's exactly what he's doing. He's about to, chapter 3, we have the call of Moses to go into Egypt and to pull the people of Israel out. It says, uh, God looked upon the children of Israel. So God sees everything that happens, whether it's good or evil. Uh, the same word for looked upon, for ah, uh, same word is used to describe God revealing himself to people. And he's about to reveal himself to Moses. He's about to be seen by Moses. And he's about to reveal himself, who he is, the I am, to the people of Israel. God saw the affliction of his people, their slavery, their oppression, and he was watching. You might be thinking, well, if he's watching, why didn't he do anything? We'll get to that. It's, it's tough. There's this tension here between God's sovereignty and um, and his uh, whether or not he cares, his love. Right? God is all powerful and all loving, but if he sees suffering going on and he doesn't do anything about it, maybe he's not powerful enough to take care of it, or maybe he doesn't actually love us. Right? It's the problem of evil. He saw the affliction of his people, their slavery, their oppression. And you know what? God was watching when your loved one died. And he was watching when you had that miscarriage. 
or when your parents divorced or when your child went wayward or just fill in the blank with whatever the most horrible event in your life is, God was watching. That doesn't seem like a comfort, but it ought to be. We'll, we'll get to that when we get to thinking about this. Lastly, God had respect in them. That's the, the Hebrew verb is, is yada, which is God knew. And God knows. And this, this has the idea of intimacy and, and caring. God was concerned about the people of Israel. And if we just go forward to Exodus chapter 3 and verse uh, 6 through 8, verses, verse 6 says, Moreover, he said, this is God speaking, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows, their suffering. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. Just stop right there. Oh, that's so good. Not only does God know what's going on, he is intimately aware and he cares. And he cares so much that he's willing to come down from his throne and take the suffering onto himself. Kind of jumping ahead to the Jesus part, but oh man, just look at that in verse 8. Just the beginning of verse 8. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. And just, he delivers us from our sin. Getting ahead of myself, but it's so good. God knew. And it's he saw it, he heard their cry, he looked upon it, and he knew, and he was he remembered his covenant, and he was gonna take action to fulfill the word that he spoke to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He was gonna deliver the people of Israel out of the affliction and bondage that they were in. But here's the danger. Um, there's a natural tendency to believe that God doesn't hear us or that he's forgotten his promise to never leave or forsake us or that he doesn't see what's going on and that he doesn't care. When we have to endure suffering and keep on enduring it and get to the point where it's like, I can't take it anymore. This is awful. Why am I in this set of circumstances? Why do I continue in this set of circumstances? God, why aren't you doing anything about this? And we have to endure that, and God does nothing to change the circumstances. The natural conclusion is that God does not hear us when we pray. Because our circumstances don't change, right? We assume that God doesn't hear. If God loved me, he wouldn't make me go through this, right? If if God heard me, he would change the circumstances. He hasn't changed the circumstances, therefore he doesn't hear me. Or we put it this way, if God loved me, then he would remove the circumstances. God has not removed the circumstances, therefore God doesn't love me. Right? And that's just wrong thinking. But it's so easy to fall into that kind of thinking. I mean, I think that's where, that's where we are. At least that tension is there in the text. Why, why would I keep on going and persist in prayer if God is not going to hear me? What's the point? And then we start, we start bringing up these justifications, right? I'm a good person. I've prayed. I've gone to church. I haven't done any of the evil things other people I know have done. Deliver me. Why haven't you delivered me? I'm a Christian. I've trusted Christ as my Savior. I'm your child. Is this all I get? Is this it? If we're not careful, we believe we have a standing before God in and of ourselves. And therefore, God owes me something better than my current set of circumstances. And that is super shaky ground when we start to believe that God owes us more than just a hearing. I mean, in fact... The truth of it is, God doesn't even owe us a hearing. He doesn't owe us to, to hear our prayers, to hear our groanings. What God owes us is judgment and death. 
By his grace, he grants us the privilege of prayer. It's arrogance and pride that accuses God of not hearing, thinking, I deserve better than this. God, you need to change my circumstances. You need to change them now. So the question I, I raise to that is, who do you think you are? Jesus suffered misunderstanding, rejection, betrayal, loss, torture, and death. When he did nothing wrong, and he did everything right, he cried out and groaned in the Garden of Gethsemane. And did God deliver him? No. No, he didn't. Yet, when we go through difficulties, many times because of our own sinful choices, but even if we're innocent and we cry out, we plead with God to deliver us from it for a week, and he doesn't do it. We have the audacity to accuse God of doing wrong because I deserve better than this. Because if you cared about me at all, you'd deliver me from this. If you think that way, who do you think you are? Do you think you're better than Jesus? God didn't deliver Jesus. Why do you think you deserve better treatment than Jesus himself? So what comes forward out of this is a, is a wicked motivation. I'm serving God in order to get something for myself. I want an exemption from suffering, so I'll serve God. And if that's what you're thinking, then you don't know who the God of the Bible is. You haven't been reading his word. But we typically think of the world in black and white terms. There are the good guys and there are the bad guys. Good people do not deserve to go through bad things. God owes good people good things and bad people bad things. God needs to judge evil. The problem with that is there are no good people. Right? All have sinned. Fall short of the glory of God. Right? There's none righteous. No, not even you. No, not one. We're all sinners. And if God were to wipe out all the evil in the world, guess where he would have to start? Right here with me. Because there's sin in my heart. There's evil in the world. Because we're all sinners. We wrong each other. What we need is God to change our heart. Man, that needs to be our prayer. God, please change my heart. I don't believe that it's a privilege just to be heard by you. I don't believe that it's a comfort knowing that you listen to me. And I think that I don't have anything to rejoice about unless I go to God, pray about uh, what's concerning me. And then, you know, as long as God does what I tell him to do, then God's worthy of praise. But if he doesn't answer my prayer the way I want him to, then he's not worthy of my praise because he hasn't done anything to earn my praise. That's just a wrong way to think. We ought to have something to praise God about all the time. And it's like Pastor always says, if I get nothing besides my salvation, I am blessed way beyond measure. I mean, it's, I mean, another thing that the pastor says is there ought to be something to praise God about on Wednesday nights. Every, every hand ought to be up. So I talk about how good God is. Just for who he is. Something that would be comforting to us. This text tells us that God heard their groaning. Right? God hears the groaning of his people. God is not deaf. And what a privilege it is to be heard by God. This is something that can never be taken away. Nothing can separate us from our relationship with God. No set of circumstances can take away the privilege of prayer, the privilege of entering into the presence of Almighty God. In the midst of my suffering, I can have communion and fellowship with God. And He's with me. And this says, He hears me when I pray. That's just mind blowing. That's just so much grace. Because God's busy you know, holding the entire universe together by the power of his word. And yet he hears us when we pray. Psalm 8, 3 through 5. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visitest him? 
For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Man, God is just like so far above us. And, and yet he inclines his ears to hear what's concerning us. It's just so much grace. He condescends to us. Not only that, God remembers his covenant. God remembers his covenant. Ultimately, that fulfillment is in Christ. But something that we shouldn't overlook is that God didn't remember Israel because they were the good guys. Remember, we typically think of good guys and bad guys, and God owes good to the good guys and bad to the bad guys. That's not why God remembered Israel. It's not because they were the good guys and Egypt were the bad guys. God is keeping his promise in spite of Israel rejecting their deliverer. Remember, Moses was there and he was trying to deliver those two Israelite brothers that were fighting. They rejected him and he ran off into exile. Now they rejected him then and they will continue to reject him as we go through Exodus. God remembers his covenant. God doesn't exist to give us what we want. God, or, God orders all things in accordance to his will and according to his redemptive purpose. God's working out the redemption of the whole world. And we get to be a part of that because we get to go into all the world and preach the gospel and bring more people to God. What a privilege. We may begin to think, God ought to do what I say. We assume that we know what is best given our set of circumstances. But we don't know what's best. We don't know all the variables, right? A lot of times we don't even know what to pray for. Many times we th- what we think is best may not be what is the best or in accordance with the will of God. We can only see it in hindsight in the providence of God. I mean, how many times have you heard the testimony of, you know, this situation uh came about in such a way that I would not have chosen to go through that thing. But now that I'm through it and I look back, I couldn't have asked for a better outcome. How many times have that, has that happened? We just can't see all the things that God can see and how he's working his redemption out for the whole world. There might be something that we have to go through in order for the redemption of someone that we've won't ever meet until 20 years from now. It could be 80 years. It could be generations from now. You might be raising your son or daughter, and they're going to reach an entire people group. Who knows? You'll, you'll never see that. That's how God is working his things out. We can't see everything. We can see things in hindsight. We can see the providence of God working. But we can't see everything. So to expect God to do what I say, given a set of circumstances, it's just completely unreasonable. It doesn't make any sense. That's why we should always pray, just like Jesus prayed. Not my will, but yours be done. This is, this is what I want, and given all the things that are going on right now, this, I think, is the best, but you're the one that's in charge. You know what's good. You know what's good for me. Help me to endure. Not only that, God sees. God sees. Right? God looked upon the children of Israel. This truth ought to be a great comfort. But if we have this nagging question in our mind, it gets twisted and it doesn't seem like a comfort. Like, how could God see this and not act? Well, at least in our text, God does see, and he does act. He's bringing about the deliverance of Israel from Egypt with Moses. He's about to call Moses into that ministry. He's been preparing him for 80 years to do this 40-year task. God sees, and he, he is acting out his redemption in the world. But why should it comfort me to know that God is always watching when the most horrible event in my life has happened? Well, because if you think of the alternative, it's even worse and it's unthinkable. What if God didn't see? 
What if God didn't see that horrible thing that happened? Well, then he's not sovereign, right? He doesn't know everything. He's not in control. And you have no reason to hope that things can get any better. No reason to hope that God is working all things together for your good. This reminds me of a, of a conversation that I had with a guy when I was down in seminary in Little Rock. We worked together at the, the Rock Gym down in Little Rock. His name was Corey, and he went to uh, Euler, our University of Arkansas in Little Rock. And he was a philosophy major, so me and him you know, had lots of discussions, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, but every Saturday morning, I would pick up some donuts, we'd meet at the seminary library, and we would talk. And we had this conversation that was kind of ongoing. And what I asked him was, look, it's logically impossible that there are no absolutes because then that would be the absolute, right? That's an absolute statement. So there has to be at least one absolute. And so I asked, I was like, I know what mine is. What's yours? And he didn't believe in God. And he goes, everything changes. Like, okay. He's like, yeah, everything changes. He's like, man, you know, something bad happens. Something, something is going sideways. You know what? It's okay because everything changes. It's not going to stay the same, right? The circumstances that I'm in right now, they're eventually going to change. And I was like, okay, that sounds great. But what reason do you have to believe that things will get better instead of worse? Things can change, but they can change for the worse and not the better. And that really, like, if you don't have a theology that will support why you believe things can get better in the future, you don't have anything. You have no grounding for believing why, at random chance, things should get better instead of worse. It doesn't make any sense. There's no reason behind that at all. But if we serve a God who is watching and who keeps his covenant and hears our prayers, and it's, enacts his, his redemption plan through our prayers and through our suffering. That's reason that we can believe that things can get better. I mean, if the absolute worst thing that could have happened in all of human history is that the Son of God died, and then he came back to life, then there can be a redemptive purpose to all suffering. There can be purpose and value to all suffering. And things can get better because the absolute worst thing did happen, and yet there was a good outcome after it. That's a faith mindset. Even in my suffering, I'm experiencing fellowship with Christ who suffered for me. It's not meaningless. It's not pointless. right? You don't have to go into utter despair because I'm suffering and there's no reason why it'll ever change. It has purpose. It has value. We can become more like Christ and experience the fellowship of his sufferings through suffering. We don't serve God because it'll exempt us from suffering. We serve God because he's worthy of it. Even when I am suffering, even in my suffering, even in that, it's better than what I deserve. In fact, suffering is giving a whole new meaning because of what Christ did. It serves the purpose of teaching me obedience and shaping us into better imagers of Christ. Lastly, God knows. Right? It says, God had respect unto them. God knows. That means he cares. There's intimacy and love here. God knows what you really need. And God knows what you can endure. God knows that your deliverer is coming. With, with the people of Israel, God knows that Moses is going to show up and he's going to deliver them. God is going to deliver them through Moses. There's a lot of things that we can be oppressed with. right? Failing health, disappointment of circumstances, people sinning against you, loss. But those are not the worst things. 
Those, those are not the worst things. God knows what you really need. And it's not necessarily deliverance from any of those things. What you need is deliverance from your sin. Your sin is the worst thing that you're oppressed with in your life. It's your sin. There's a holy and righteous God in heaven who requires righteousness and you sin against him on the regular. That's worse than a bad diagnosis because sin separates you from God. A bad diagnosis can't do that. Nothing can separate you from God but your sin. You need a deliverer and God knows this and he provided Jesus Christ. That's how good God is. He knows what you can endure. There's times where you're just suffering through some set of circumstances and it's hard and don't know what to do. And you just think, I can't take any more. And then I see you next Sunday. Like, well, looks like you took a little bit more. God knows. God knows what you can handle. The book of Exodus doesn't end with Israel being delivered out of Egypt, but with the construction of the tabernacle. What that tells us is it's not enough to be delivered out of Egypt. Israel needed to be delivered into a relationship with God. That's what we need, and that's what God knows. When something bad happens, we ask, where was God? Right? How could God see this and not act? What is he doing? Have you ever thought about this? He's in the same place that he was when his own son was crushed and killed for our sins, not, not his own. And that's where God will be. God is working out his redemption in the world. And it's complex. We need to trust him. God knows. And not only that, Jesus knows specifically our pain and our suffering. We don't have a savior who cannot identify with us. He was tempted at every point like we are, yet he was without sin. He knows what you're going through. He knows your pain, and he knows it without deserving it. He overcame it at the cross, and it, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. But God knows. He knows intimately what we need and what we can handle. Something that we can have hope in is whatever I suffer, it is temporary. Even if I die from it, we don't take these circumstances with us to heaven. And it's not worthy even to compare to what's waiting for me there, what God has prepared for us in heaven. Romans 8, 18, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Finally, from Stuart in his Exodus commentary, well, God was initiating the process of deliverance and the circumstances of both Moses and Israel were about to change. Implicitly, the theological issue here is not whether or how people suffer. The issue is, does suffering go unnoticed? If it does not, and indeed the one doing the noticing is the true omnipotent and loving covenant God, his people can properly surmise that their suffering may well be part of a plan that is a suffering with a distinct beginning and end, a hardship understood by and watched over by a sovereign who will not let it continue without good purpose and result. Our prayer ought to be, Lord, use this to drive me to Christ and use it to make me more like Christ. Don't waste my suffering. It can have a good result. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you for hearing us and for the privilege of prayer. It can never be taken away. Nothing can separate us from your, from your presence in prayer. Thank you for remembering your covenant, your covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That we see the fulfillment of that in Christ, Lord, that we can have a personal relationship with you because of Christ, because you fulfilled your word to Abraham. Thank you for remembering your covenant. Thank you for always watching over us. God, thank you for knowing what it's like to be a human being and identifying with us.
Help us to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.